All right, Mark, we're live. I'm just going to implant the uh, the thumbnail here and change the the title because it just shows up sort of as a generalized uh, live stream. So I'm going to just title it here, and then we'll we'll get right into to the podcast. Cool. My first podcast. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of it's kind of both, right? We're 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 doing it live, but then it will also come out a, in a in a podcast formation. Um, so we'll we'll have both. So people watching it live will get the unfettered, unedited uh, version of it, and then you know the rest of the <laughs> everybody else will get uh, will get to you know the the more abbreviated. And usually we we will we'll list the whole thing um so that everybody can benefit from it unless there's like a mess up or something like that yesterday we we, we had like a 15 minute long break because the computer on the other side went dead <laughs> no that's not what you want well it happens okay let me just get this up. that's good all right saving that we're almost there i'd say Less than 30 seconds. I'm in no hurry. All right. Sometimes for the viewership, though, we want, we want everybody to think that. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of this stuff with the formatting of how this live streams, I can't upload it in advance until it actually goes to YouTube. So mm -hmm. I, have, I have to wait until the. the like a preview. There's not like a preview, a waiting room kind of a thing? No, unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess unless I, I, I change the screen to to look like that, but it would still actually be live. We would just be simulating a waiting room. I got you. I'm sure that somebody in, in light of all this, though, will come up with some sort of creative fashion to be able to stream, you know, all these different platforms into one. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for whoever is able to do that seamlessly. Well, I know both uh, Weir and Roger McNamee are working uh, quite intently on that and paying crews of very smart people to help them with uh, basically what they're trying to work on is the thing of uh, being able to play together in real time from different locations via the internet yeah yeah okay now it looks like we're we're good that's working this is working all right cool working is good we're we are we're ready in, in audio for you sounds okay yeah Audio is okay for you, Mark? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, today we have uh, our guest is Mark Karen. Uh, Mark, you've kind of worn so many different hats over the years. I don't, I don't even know how you, how you self-describe, although I always think of you as a solo artist, a sideman, a session musician, and you've kind of had a really versatile uh, career as far as the people that you've played with, that you, you know, really uh, enveloped in in the in the jam scene, sort of in in the later part of your career with Phil Lesh and Bob Weir with Rat Dog, but then also doing pop stuff with the Rembrandts, um, and you know, I mean, I know a lot of people know them from the Friends theme song, but you got, you came in after that, but certainly that was more of a pop thing, and then you know, you were in L.A. doing sessions, you do sessions in the Bay Area, and then have your have a great solo career of some really cool music and some really cool uh you know tones like i'm always envious of your guitar tones you have some great gear some great vintage guitars um i've seen them you you showing up some of them on facebook recently um so i want to get into all that but how how do you for somebody who's listening to this who's never heard of mark karen before how would you sort of describe your style how do you how do you self-describe because i know i gave sort of a, a blanket of a lot of different things and maybe you don't identify with any of that but how would you sort of describe yourself um i identify with everything you just said and more is i i guess would be the deal for me you know i uh in in a somewhat different way i kind of think of guitar in general and what i do in general uh similarly to what i've heard that keith and ronnie say when when people ask questions like well, which one of you plays rhythm and which one of you plays lead? And they say, hey, we play guitar, you know, we weave. It's not like one job or the other. It's all of the above, you know. And, uh, so for me, yeah, I, I love pop music. 
I, I love rootsy blues and old school soul and all that. That's probably, that's probably where I really live. Like if, if I were doing the little rundown you did earlier, I would have included Delaney Bramlett because that's a, that's one of the big feathers in my cap as far as how it, how it touched me. Personally. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you know, I, I, I love session work. I'm, I'm fascinated in the studio. I love playing live in pretty much any format as long as I can be musical, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that, you know, the, the, the beauty of, of the type of session work that you do is, is that I feel like you have a very, you know, the, you, you have the thing that's the hardest thing for guitar their own sound and you know a lot of studio musicians get called because they can sound like a lot of different people and they can be a chameleon and that's like a, a great skill but but i think at the same time like the hardest skill as a guitar player is to develop something that's uniquely you and, and doesn't uh doesn't sound like anybody else and and you know when when i hear you pick up a guitar you know the, the thing that that is impressive to me about your tone in particular is that you your tone can be dark but it cuts through any mix and i don't know like it's like i struggle to be able to make my tone as warm and fat as yours is without completely being buried so i don't know like how the trick works but i've seen you live several times and i'm just always wondering like man how does it get it that fat and it doesn't just get overtaken um because that's always a struggle that I, i've had like i want my guitars to sound fat but sometimes it's at the peril of the of the mix um so i always think it's it's great to hear that but i want to kind of go back in, in the early days of like kind of what you feel like was sort of the start of your you know professional career where you're actually sort of making a living playing guitar was that in la or was that before you moved to la or kind of put put us kind of there way 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 before um i didn't move to la until when was it 90 91 something like that i was you know i was already 35 36 years old by the time i moved to los angeles mm -hmm. spent my life in the bay area um you know cutting my teeth like most of us guitar players do playing in the bars and doing the vanity cd session work and uh you know kind of whatever whatever it took learning about gear buying too much gear play, spending too much time tweaking on gear yeah uh, you know all that um uh, so how did I start? I mean, I was playing locally. I, I kind of, my, my musical thing really came to fruition as a kid in the Half Moon Bay area. You know, I went to high school and stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And we had the typical high school bands and all that, and that was great. And then when I was about 19, um, I was itching to get out of Half Moon Bay and see what else was out there. And I moved to Marin uh, because in Marin, there was the Grateful Dead, there was the Sons of Champlin, uh, there was the Sleeping Lady Cafe, which at the time was this really cool hippie music venue. Uh, there was Mount Tamil Pius. There were all the beautiful hippie chicks. <laughs> so there was, there was a reason to move to Marin County. And I moved up there and I played for a while and I met this woman named Sarah Baker. And she actually, uh, I credit her with helping me cut my teeth um, in professional music. You know, she had her own band. And it was the first really pro band that I'd ever been involved with, where we were actually making the the Bay Area Chitlin circuit through all the different venues, you know, and playing several nights a week on an ongoing basis. And we had a pretty good following. And that kind of introduced me to that world. And, and I just never got off that train. You know? Yeah. So so did was that pretty much what you were what you were doing as far as being in, in the in the Bay Area or did you go to several different groups or were you doing a mixture of solo and sideman and session work or what what did kind of the the early days look like? Yeah, all again, all the above. I, I'm not trying to be evasive or vague here. Sure. It's, uh, it's just my appreciation of music and my attraction to music is so multifaceted that I tend to be pretty bored if I'm just doing one thing, you know, like most people that know about me now know about me through my connections to the Grateful Dead world. And that's wonderful. And I love that music, but I would not be happy if that's all I did, you know, which yeah. is, I, I always had Jemima Puddle Duck when I was doing the uh, rat dog thing and whatnot. And in those early days, uh, it was similar. You know, I would do whatever sessions came up just because I wanted to get into the studio. I kind of didn't care what the music was, as long as I could have the experience 
of being in the studio and hearing those sounds and and listening to my own sound under that kind in that atmosphere where I could get really detailed, you know, and and pick the engineers' brains about how to get better sounds and what are you doing and well, what's that preamp and why do you use that preamp instead of that other preamp and you know just that whole thing. Where were you doing most of the sessions when you were living in Marin County at that time? Where was kind of the place that people would congregate to to record? Um, well, certainly the plant was one of them. Uh, you know, that's been there for a hundred million years, and uh, and it was very active still uh, when I was cutting my teeth in my pre-LA days. So, quite a bit there, uh, and I was involved with a studio called Trace Virgos uh, from very very early in their inception. They started out as an eight-track studio up on Mount Tam in somebody's house, uh, and they wound up building the first true live end dead end full-on recording studio that later uh, Narda Michael Walden bought. And that's where he did all those uh, Mariah Carey and Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston uh, records. And that's the San Rafael. Nice. There was the Ice House in San Rafael. And then at a certain point, you know, what wound up happening, uh, I think we're probably all familiar with this to one degree or another. Uh, for many years, you know, if you were going to do a session, you had to go to, you know, one of those places or hiders in the city or whatever. Um, but then in the 80s, people's home studios started cropping up everywhere. And I was getting a lot less calls to go into big fancy studios and a lot more calls where it's like, you know, yeah, just bring your little deluxe and a couple of guitars. We'll be doing it in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so what did that what did that early rig look like when you were when you were doing sessions locally in Marin County and, and kind of going you know, to different studios and people's houses and stuff like that. What did kind of the version one uh, professional uh, Mark Karen rig look like? Oh, God. You know, I was such a gear whore. Um, <laughs> still I am. I can't seem to I can't seem to quite get off that train either. Uh, you know, it was constantly changing. Um, you know, there was a period where stomp stomp boxes were somewhat frowned upon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm glad to see that period has changed, and I'm glad to see the stomp boxes have really uh, stepped up and improved in the in the quality and what they offer the user in this day and age. But you know, there I I, I started out like most of us with just a, a decent amp and a couple of pedals, if that. Uh, pretty early on, I got into being tweaky. You know, I had a vintage twin that I took to a a place that used to be in San Francisco called Magic Music Machines. And uh, before Mesa Boogies or any of those things came out, I asked them if they could take the other channel of the twin and separate the two and put a master volume on only one so that I could use an AB box and be able to switch between clean and dirty, you know. So pretty early in the game, I mean, this was when I was about 20, so this would have been 75. Mm -hmm. um, I was already like modding amps and changing things around. <laughs> Had it, I had to have it be different, you know. What uh, kind of pedals were you using at that time? Do you remember? Uh, you know, I had a, I had an old MXR. I forget if it was a Phase 45 or a Phase 90, but I think it was a 90. I might have had a Phase 100 at some point. Um, I've had various Wawa pedals. I had some fuzz boxes early on, but I never really made friends with a with a true fuzz box. Uh, and I didn't really use a lot of gain-oriented pedals early on. Um, I was one of the one of the main rigs that I used actually was a vintage Super for my clean sound, and then an actual physical AB box uh, that went to a Gibson. I think it was a Falcon Tweed amp from the fifties that was really fairly low wattage. So I would just turn everything on ten on that amp, mm -hmm. and and AB back and forth for clean to dirty. Mm. Uh, you know, but then the late 80s and, and or the late 70s and 80s rolled around and, and uh, you know, I started hearing about all the rack stuff and uh, Rivera was building an amp back there back then called I think it was called the TBR1 mm -hmm. and it was available as a rack mount unit. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's built like a brick shit house. I mean, the thing you could have dropped it off the Empire State Building in a place. Yeah. And it was like four spaces or something like that. It was pretty four, four six six yeah it was big it was big and heavy chunky you know really chunky um but it was cool you know and and uh so around that era 
I, I got one of those. I got a TC2290. I got a TC1210 spatial expander. Uh, I think I was using a, a, a Rev7 for my reverb, a, a Yamaha Rev7. Um, you know, so I was going for the full on rack thing. Um, my clean sound at that point was one of those little half rack uh, Schultz Rockman front ends so that I could. Oh, yeah thin, sparkly, compressy, chorusy, 80s, clean rhythm. Yeah. Sound, you know? yeah. Um, and then my lead sound uh, for quite a bit of that time was this guy, Matt Bakke, used to have a company called EMB. And he had this thing called, I think it was the MP1, I think was what the, the model was. But it was uh, 128 MIDI programmable presets of tube preamp that was more or less designed to be Marshall-ish. Okay. Um, and that was where I got my gain stuff. So not related to the ADA preamp? Because uh, I think they had an MP1 as well. Related, actually, because, you know, Baki was an interesting guy. You know, he was uh, in the East Bay here in the Bay Area and very innovative, but he never really had a lot of success. And uh, so I remember at one point in the early 80s when I got turned down to this new thing called MIDI. And I was like, what? You mean different products can talk to each other? And there's a thing called program change? Yeah. So I called Matt, who was a buddy of mine at the time, and I said, dude, is there any way you could build a pedal that would send out just simply, I don't want anything else, not fancy, it would just send MIDI program change commands and be programmable as to what button would send program changes where? Uh, and he said, yeah, I could do that. And he built me this pedal. Uh, and a few years later, he wound up marketing that to ADA. Okay. And the ADA pedal that was the, the uh, that called up the presets, you know, I forget what, what that model was called, but everybody, they were ubiquitous. Everybody had one for a long time. Yeah. Uh, that was actually Matt Bakke's design that actually originated with me suggesting to him that he that huh. something like that for me. So this became the rack mount version of the MP1, the programmable preamp box well, that's the, the MP1, actually come to think of it, the MP1 may have always been ADA. That may never have had anything to do with Baki. Okay, okay. Then ADA also bought, ba bought Baki's uh, MIDI controller thing. By the way, I found uh, this Rivera thing. I'll show you. Oh, nice. Check that out. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Yep, that's it. That's yeah, it looks like it's, uh, yeah, it looks like it's probably, uh, that's like two, four. Yeah, it might even be eight space. <laughs> <laughs> now it looks like it's a six. Yeah, it like it's a six. but look at this. And I don't know if you can tell their values. I don't know if you can tell the picture, but that Rivera is—it's uh, all hollow between those letters and behind it. So it's this etched cut. Uh, oh, interesting. Whole piece of craftsmanship, really. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, that, I had I had to look it up. We actually I had I'd interviewed Paul Rivera. Uh, maybe a week and a half ago and we talked a little bit about this and he, he said he made that between the time that he had left Fender mm -hmm. and uh, and he said that he didn't have the he said the reason why he came out with that instead of an amp wasn't because he was specifically trying to get into the rack mount gear good move for him uh, money wise because that, that was sort of the, the the transition that a lot of people were making but he said the reason why he got into it was because the overhead was so much lower because the cost of, of wood for, for uh, cabinets and speaker cabinets and all that stuff was really high. And so doing it out of uh, with a rack mount version was significantly cheaper. That I'm, I'm surprised by that, but it kind of makes sense. Yeah. So he said it was, it was cheaper and he could do it out of his house. And he talked about, you know, how, he went to the first NAMM show with the prototype, you know, of it and was taking orders kind of based off the prototype. And, and that was sort of the launching product before he got really into, um, you know, doing what he ultimately, you know, ended up doing, which is having a, a pretty, you know, a healthy line of amplifiers that he that he produced over time. And, of course, had those modded fenders that everybody was using in the 70s and 80s, the Rivera Stage 2 or whatever it was called. I don't know if you remember those. Remember that I did, I think I remember him being involved with something that that was a, being used popularly in L.A. called the Super Champ. Is that was that him? 
Well, he he uh, designed that amp when he went to Fender. Uh, he d- just had, a, had redesigned kind of their whole line of amplifiers to, to be channel switching and kind of have a lot of these modifications that he was doing before he worked for Fender to vintage Fenders for guys like Steve Lukather and Paul Jackson Jr. and and uh, you know guys like that that were doing sessions and stuff like that. And when I was talking to Paul Jackson Jr. earlier this week live on here, he was talking about how, you know, that amp he still uses. And he said, you know, somebody had offered him, I can't remember what he said, it was like 50 grand or something like that for it. So it was sort of like the, it was before Mesa Boogie, it, you know, before Randall Smith, before, you know, Dumble in some ways, I mean, according to Paul Jackson, I, I know Dumble was around in the seventies, but I don't know, you know, what the, what the cachet was versus Paul Rivera. Certainly Paul would have an advantage working out of Valley Arts in, yeah. the, in LA. It's funny. I actually remember there was a band called Eddie and the Tide and the guitar player from Eddie and the Tide had a Dumble back then. What year? What do you think this would have been? Very early 80s. Okay. You know, um, definitely before I got sober. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I remember always being pretty impressed with that amp. And, you know, it had the Vox grill cloth and it was covered, you know, so it had this very unique look to it and, he always had great tone, but I didn't know shit. You know, I'd, I'd kind of heard about this mythical dun- Dumble guy, but I really didn't know shit about it then. Yeah. It's, a minute ago, you mentioned Boogie and Randall Smith. Yeah. And I was giving you sort of the quick, the Reader's Digest uh, overview of kind of my progression up to the 80s or whatever. I completely forgot to mention Boogie. Okay, and let's hear the unabridged. Let's do it. Boogie was actually a pretty big part of my life. I was sitting there going... He's asking me what, what distortion pedals I used, and I can't think of any, so what's going on? I certainly didn't play all clean, uh, and I realized I hadn't been thinking about the fact that I was a boogie guy. So after that era when I was playing the Super Reverb and the, uh, and the Gibson, uh, I moved into that Fender, which I modded to have a second channel, which had a master volume. Right. But not too long after that, the boogie started coming out. And I found myself with an old Mark I with the cane front and the wood cabinet and the whole bit, you know. And I used that amp for quite a while mm. uh, with pretty much, to my recollection, pretty much no effects. Um, maybe occasionally a wah-wah pedal or a volume pedal, but basically it was like, here's good tone with reverb. Yay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And did you have a head and cab or did you have a combo? Originally, I had a 112 combo. Um, I don't recall if that one had the little five band EQ on it or not. But then, you know, I, I, I became pretty committed to Boogie for a while. Yeah. Uh, for several years, every, you know, I, I got to know Mike Bendinelli at the factory really well. And mm-hmm. he was kind of the head of the, uh, you know, uh, along with Randy, obviously. He was doing a lot of the tweaks and a lot of the repairs and a lot of the mods. Yeah. Yeah, he still works there. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. He, in fact, uh, modded, or he, he serviced my, I have a, I have a 2C Plus that I got, you know, because in our, in our rehe- or in the, the showroom complex in Burbank, the band, uh, I'm trying to go with, oh, it was America, the band America are, have a locker that's across from our showroom, and they had kind of like a garage sale in front of the, the, their storage locker, one of the items that was in there was this 2C plus and uh and i had asked the guy first of all what version it was because it's sometimes it's difficult to tell aesthetically whether which version of the two it was mm-hmm. you know but it looked like it had the graphic eq and it had the simul class and all that stuff and then on the transformer it actually has like a a piece of masking tape on it which says 2C plus on it, you know, and so I confirmed with the technician that was there, and he and he sold it to me, and for I think it was eight hundred dollars. And this was recently; this was like a, maybe a year ago or something like that. And uh, but he said that they hadn't used it in decades, and they were just harvesting tubes from it for like what the Mesa Boogie that they were using now, which was a a Lone Star or something like that. And it was so funny to me because those 2C pluses are so much. But to me, I mean, I love the Lone Star. It's a fine amp. But to me, a 2C Plus is just like such an iconic, uh, you know, Mesa Boogie that it's strange that they that they would just harvest tubes from it. So it had no tubes in it. And uh, and I think that they had like taken knobs off of it to put it on the other amps, you know, over time. And Mike uh, took it for me and completely like 
we restored it back to to i mean there wasn't really any mods or anything like that that they had done to it it was just like it hadn't been taken care of in a long time and i was like yeah just let mike do it because he knows those amps and it sounds great it's incredible now <laughs> but yeah. man that was that's that's the best deal i've got on the 2c plus because i look at them now and like you know they're for a head it's four grand 3500 at least i would imagine that 800 for that 2c plus is a pretty great price even today in the current market but it says america right on the side of it in this stencil like a spray painted venture a highway baby yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah i mean they they everybody i mean if you were if you were a cat and uh, you had a mesa boogie i mean everybody did larry carlton had mesa boogies and yeah exactly and 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 once you know once i once i got into the mark one you know then i then i became a a convert and i i stayed with them i think up through the mark three nice did so, you have a 2c plus at some point probably you know i i kind of upgrading and changing as they would change i'd keep in touch with bendinelli and he would keep me abreast of what was going on and i tried to stay current because they were always coming up with new innovative ways to think about amp design you know and yeah. it's because now in 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 hindsight i still have a lot of appreciation for what they were up to and all that kind of thing yeah but my tastes have drastically changed yeah uh, and so now for me personally, and this is nothing against boogies, I think they're great for what they do, you know, and, and if a boogie floats your boat, awesome. Uh, they certainly used to float mine. But uh, for some reason, I just can't relate to the tone or the feel of those amps anymore. Um, and I, I find myself turning a lot more to vintage amps or uh, vintage designs. Um, with some tweaks and upgrades, you know, like I really appreciate the Dumble approach because I watched your little thing on Dumble the other day and uh, <laughs> and you're right, you know, I mean, all he was really doing was building bulletproof fenders, uh, but they really are. I mean, they're, they're bulletproof and they sound, the sound stage is much bigger and broader. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're heavily, they're heavily optimized. And of course they have a gain channel, which, which is part of the signature sound um, that fenders don't have. Yeah, uh, well, I'm using more of a steel string singer bass stamp, so I don't have that gain channel. Yeah, yeah, but even so, those are just yeah, just incredible uh, amplifiers all around. But do you remember much about like back in that time, like learning about dumbbells and like you know, did you ever have any interactions with him or or other than just no? I was interested like, to go and check him out. By the time I was actually aware of them enough to be in a position or curious about, you know, actually see, looking into getting one for me, they were so freaking expensive. I, it was just like, I can't even think about that. You know, it's not even, it's not even on my radar, um, except as some, it was cool. You know, I, I, I was hanging with Larry Carlton for a little bit when I was living in, in Los Angeles and, uh, and I was able to play his personal Dumble a bunch. So that was cool. You know, I had some experience with Dumbles uh, but I never had occasion to talk to Howard slash Alexander um, because I was just never in a position to buy one. You know, Do you so remember back then what the going rate was like when, because this would have been the early 90s when you were hanging with Larry? Yeah, I don't really, but I, I'm going to guess, and this is really a guess, so don't quote me on this, but I, I would guess somewhere between five and 10 grand. Okay. You know? Yeah. I mean, certainly reasonable compared to the 30 to 50 or 100 grand that you might pay today, uh, but way out of my league. So yeah. I was stoked when, you know, when Two Rock happened and Steve Kimmock turned me on to Two Rock and, you know, they were kind of doing the Dumbly thing. And then with all the other uh, Bluto Tone and Glassworks and some of these other companies that are doing it now, they're still pricey. Yeah. But, you know, I, it's, it's at the point now where a pro or some, even a non-pro, even a, a, a hobby guitar player that's really passionate about tone might actually be able to consider buying one. It's yeah. not, you know, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. like it used Yeah, to. yeah. So after you kind of got through with Boogie, what year would you say that kind of was around? Hmm. After you had your dual rectifier. Yeah, it's a tough call. Yeah, yeah I never had a dual rectifier. <laughs> um, I mean, post-boogie was the Revera. Okay, and the with Re the rack. 
you know, the the Revere was like, I think I had a 14 or 18 space rack or something, you know, with, uh, with all that TC stuff I mentioned and a couple right. of plays and mixers and the rack uh, distortion preamp and the rack. Rock. Did you put them together yourself? Uh, gosh, no, I must have had help, but you know what? It's really, I'm disappointed in my brain right now because I <laughs> had help and I am drawing a blank on who might have helped me build that rig. Yeah. It, I well, it's, not, it's unimportant. We can move on. I just wanted to see if you remembered. Yeah, no, I just, but, but it, it, it may actually have been me now that I think of it, because at that time I'm, I was much more of a tech geek. Yeah. I am now <laughs> fascinated by manuals and willing to read them in depth. And now I don't want to be bothered reading the PDFs that come with things, you know? Right. But, right. And I would read all that stuff. And I was the kind of guy that people that I knew musicians, uh, when they wanted, you know, when they were curious about some new piece of gear, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they would often call me. Yeah. And yeah. To help them learn how to use it or, how would they incorporate it into their rig and how do they match the levels and all that. Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly a lot more of that going on back then. <laughs> Level yeah. matching. Yeah. Um, and then, so the Rivera, the rack age, this was around what year would you say? Mid eighties? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mid eighties until, until I moved to LA, I moved to LA with my rack rig actually. Okay. And how long did that stay until you decided to, to change your, your, uh, your gear again? Um, it was the move to LA that had me change my gear. Okay. Uh, you know, guitar is a, 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 a fickle mistress. Uh, you know, there, there are absolutely trends. We like to think that we, we, we hear with our ears. We like to think that we think with our minds, but actually I think a lot of times we hear with our eyes and think with our hearts. Um, and so when I got down to L.A., you know, I had I had gone to painstaking troubles to make all the tones that came out of my rack rig sound very vintage. You know, I wasn't into Lukather's hyper processed approach or whatever. I I was capable of that, but it wasn't my thing. Right. So, you know, when I would come into the to a, a, an audition or something down there, I would have vintage type guitars and I and, and vintage sounds programmed into my rack. But I would automatically not have the gig as soon as I rolled the rack in. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening at that time was people were going for funkier. They were going for a little bit on the grunge side or a little bit on the dark sort of vintage Black Crowsy flavor. Or right. So people were heavily favoring guitar players that had vintage boxes and vintage marshals and vintage basements and very simple setups and a very direct guitar and amp connection. So I would roll in with this big rack rig and almost get laughed out of the room without them even listening to me. <laughs> and uh, which frustrated the piss out of me because I was going, oh, wait, you know, I know these are vintage -y sounds. Why don't you at least listen? But yeah. like, hey, people, a lot of times they listen with their eyes or their heart, you know. And uh, so I, I, I realized that to survive, I might have to rethink all of that. And as I started exploring the old amps and all that, I realized, oh, now I see why they're doing this. <laughs> because, right. you know, I was pretty happy with my rack stuff. But once I started getting to know tweed fenders and 60s boxes and played a few really nice plexi marshals and stuff, I was like, oh, fuck. Mm. Oh, this is good stuff, you know? <laughs> so what was sort of the first, you know, amp that you got after sort of abandoning the rack? Um, I went through a few. I actually got a JTM, a real JTM 45 and matching cabinet at one point. Uh, I bought a, one of the, the reissue basements when they first came out. I, that was a, an attempt at going vintage. Yeah. I've, I've played real basements and love them, but the early reissue basements, not so much. Yeah. Um, I then, there was this guy named Jared Lee, British guy, and he was designing... Uh, amps uh, and they were going to be rack amps but designed basically with box circuitry mm -hmm. all tube and I commissioned him to buy to make me an amp and I paid him in front or half up front or something like that and then I don't remember what happened but for some reason he couldn't come through and I never got my amp 
And so we got into this antagonistic relationship for a while. And finally, to get me off his back, he had an old like 62 or 63 Vox AC-15 Twin 12, which was nice. an AC-15, but with two of the Vox Blue 12-inch speakers. Mm -hmm. That amp, to this day, I kick myself for ever getting rid of it. It was my friend for a long time. It was incredible in the studio. Not quite loud enough to work live. Mm -hmm. uh, so at one point, I, I ended up selling it to Michael Lockwood. Do you know Michael? Yeah, I yeah. do. So Michael Lockwood used to be down there. He used to work at Guitars R Us down on Vintage Row. Mm -hmm. And he loved that amp too. And I sold it to him. And I ended up with a, an AC a 63 AC30 with a top boost add-on kit um, that was actually the base model. And I want to take just a second to side to sidetrack here about this because sure. for anybody that's into Vox and especially vintage Vox, I don't think it's super common knowledge that there are the base models out there that I guess originally were designed to, or at least marketed uh, to be for bass guitar. Um, I don't think they'd be very good for bass guitar, but one of my complaints about the classic AC-30s was always that they had incredible touch and feel and tone and gain and all of that, but they robbed the bottom end a little bit. They were pretty mid-rangey, kind of boxy sounding to my ear, which is cool for certain things, especially if you're going for the really authentic Beatle thing. Um, but for me personally and what I like to hear in tone, I, I wanted more bottom. And when I found this base model Vox, another amp that I've kicked myself for getting rid of so many times I can't even count. Uh, it was beautiful because it was an AC-30 that had this extra womp down below. Uh, so for anybody that's maybe Vox curious, but feels that they're a little bit mid-rangey, maybe look for a, a base model or see if you can find the schematic for a base model. And I bet you could probably mod a, a stock AC-30 to be a base model without ruining it for the collector people. That's really interesting. You're on the vintage market comparatively to standard Vox AC30 of the same year, for example. Uh, I I have no idea. My guess is that it might be pricier, just because okay. you know if something is rare, then suddenly it's worth more. Yeah, okay. yeah. But every once in a while, I get a sleeper. By the way, somebody uh, bent Tom in the comments here said there was two 112 Dumble Overdrive specials at East Coast Music Exchange in Kent. Uh, Cantonsville, Maryland, 1993. I don't know. It was $5,000 in 1993 money. I was eight years old, so I didn't have much of a concept of <laughs> what $5,000 would buy. Yeah, well, I know I didn't have $5,000 to spend on an amp in, 19, in the early 90s. So <laughs> wouldn't have mattered to me how, how, many how many of those there were available at five grand. I wasn't going to be buying one. Yeah, yeah. What about like, I mean, we've talked a lot about the amps and stuff like that, but what about guitars? I mean, you have a ton of really cool vintage guitars. When did you start kind of collecting those? That was an LA thing. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I had gone through my time in the Bay Area. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I dove into the, to the 80s train pretty much full tilt boogie, you know, so uh, my primary guitar through those years was an act, it was actually a Japanese made um uh 57 reissue strat that i butchered and put a floyd rose in and a humbucker in the bridge position nice because that's what we did then <laughs> yeah no nobody was immune man that dan huff strat you know it was a 65 sunburst that had Wait. you know a floyd and seymour duncan you know pickups and a, and a humbucker in the bridge and all that so I saw your homage to that on the uh, on the wet dry wet YouTube thing you did. You yeah, know? yeah, it's cool. It's a, it's it's actually you know LSL built built mine, but so it's not a it's not a Fender, but um, it's it's really you know it's great. You know this one has uh, Demarzio Virtual Vintage, which was what a lot of the it's not what Dan Huff had, but it was what a lot of those like kind of Tyler, kind of Schechter. Tom Anderson sort of transition because most of those guys like Tyler and Tom Anderson, I think that they all work for Schecter mm. and then Schecter went out of business and then they kind of did their own things. Um, or, and I think they also bought a lot of surplus from Schecter, uh, like some of those early Tom Anderson necks and some of those early 
uh, Tyler necks that had the fender headstock shape. You know, I think that they were getting those from Schechter. Mm, I see. Now I didn't know about those guys. I, I had never done any research and I, in my head had somehow decided <laughs> that uh, they must have come from Valley Arts in that scene because the guitars were sort of similar in concept. Yeah, yeah, they were. I think that, I don't know. I mean, I could be totally wrong about this because I'm sort of retelling it through, um, there's, a, there's a guy in the Bay Area that works on my guitars um, named Benny uh, Rodriguez, and he used to work for Tom Anderson in the early 90s and would talk about sort of the, the relationship between Jim Tyler and, and he and uh, and how they had kind of come together at Schechter and that Tom was, you know, was the first guy in the San Fernando Valley that had a CNC machine. And so everybody was coming to him in the LA area who wanted to have CNC necks. Um, so that included, you know, Pensa, Sir, in, in the, I think Sir was in New York at the time, not yet in California also talked about, you know, making necks for Tyler. Now, I don't know, like, at, you know, how how much of this is true or the degree to which they were doing, but I think he was seeing, seeing bodies and necks for a lot of those guys, including, you know, himself, Tom Anderson, and then also for Tyler and for Sir Pensa. And I think even Sir independently when Sir was, was established again in California um, separately. But, uh, yeah, the, the, but long story short yeah everybody everybody was doing the super strat thing i think it was just it was just the, the vibe you never had a valley arts though huh no no when i was in the bay area i had i had that at, at frankenstein strat thing mm -hmm. uh and at some point i bought um like a, a 52 reissue telly mm -hmm. um in fact as a quick story about that when i had moved to la uh i was getting more and more into guitars and I, my tastes were shifting from flashy to funky mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the appearance and all that kind of stuff yeah and i decided i wanted to take the issue telly and make it more like springsteen's make it look you know cooler and funkier so i was going to strip it uh, -huh. and, uh i remember one point taking it all apart and putting the body on a bunch of paper in my bedroom and taking that jasco paint remover gel and just smearing it all over the body of the guitar uh -huh. and then letting it sit and do its thing and about an hour later, I started hearing these weird sounds. Ping, ping, pop, ping. And I looked over and the coating of poly on that guitar was so thick and so hard that as it was beginning to dissolve from the thinner, it was actually shattering and sending pieces flying all over my bedroom. It was crazy. Wow. And I got the finish off of that guitar uh, if any of you have one of these old guitars built in the in the late seventies to early eighties by Fender that that are that seem to have a really thick coat, poly finish, strip them. That guitar opened up by about forty or fifty percent. I couldn't believe the difference in response. Wow. That guitar. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and you probably looked. You know, you look like you were born to run after that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, so that guitar became kind of my go-to guitar. Um, <clears throat> the modded Fender kind of found its way to the back of my closet. Yeah. Um, I put together a stock Frankenstein Strat out of parts and used that at one, and then at that point I stumbled across uh, a 67 Gretsch uh, Nashville, which mm -hmm. I still have and still adore. And um, those three guitars were kind of my go-tos for quite a while until I went to the Santa Monica guitar show one year and this guy that I kind of vaguely knew Mark Ferrari was walking through the hall and he had a, a an old looking brown Gibson case and I stopped him and I said Mark what you got in there he said oh let me show you it's for sale <laughs> and he opened up the case and there was a 52 Les Paul gold top in there that had been uh, shifted around to be uh, an ABR one and stop tail that had been routed for humbuckers and had a pair of EMG humbuckers in it. And that somebody had had Gibson refinish as a sunburst back in the late sixties. So the burst was beautiful. I mean, it had aged really nicely. It was, you know, it was scratched up and worn through just right and all that. 
looked a lot like the Peter Green one, actually. Wow. Uh, and I loved it. But since it was originally a gold top, the upper bout uh, that this part of your arm, um, most of the top was this beautiful figured maple. But since it was going to be painted gold, they didn't have to do the matched, the book matched tops. And the maple didn't go all the way up. So there was a little patch at the top there that looked like plywood. <laughs> it was not pretty. So I had my buddy Paul Flynn at True Tone Music down there. Um, he's brilliant, and he does really cool stuff for vintage guitars. He really knows his shit. He ordered the bronze powder from uh, the historic shop, and we regolded the top of that guitar. And ever since then, that guitar, that my gold top Les Paul, uh, is kind of my go-to guitar. I, I, I play it a lot. This is this is the one you still have now. Yes, yes. And then how much? How much was that one back then? It, hundred dollars how much twelve hundred twelve hundred dollars wow so cheap I yeah mean, I believe my good fortune yeah that's incredible and then that started you know that that I, I the flame was lit for me as far as trying to find vintage instruments you know and i've always gone for mutts and players i don't care about original i'm not a collector i want to have the old wood and the old pickups and the old feel and vibe yeah paying ten bazillion dollars and uh, so in L.A., I just I, I, I started seeking those kinds of guitars. Right. And as luck would have it, in 98, I wound up after years of, you know, after about six or seven years kicking around L.A. and doing OK, you know, but not doing great. Uh, suddenly I got called up to, to play with uh, Bobby Weir and Phil Lesh and all those guys and the other ones. And all of a sudden I was making a decent paycheck for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I'm very pleased with about the way my life has worked out is that even though I don't have some super big time gig anymore, uh, I had that experience and I'm super grateful for having had that experience. And having had that experience and made the commensurate income for that period of time put me in a position to, you know, now I have a beautiful real 62 Strat I have a real no caster that's a wonderful instrument. Uh, I have a mid 50s ES350 that's fabulous. I have a 1930s uh, national style O. Um, you know, I, I've, I've managed to amass a pretty good collection of players' guitars. Yeah. You know, another story that I want to get well, well, first of all, in, it had EMGs in your 52 gold top conversion, as God intended. Uh, yeah, they, they didn't. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> what did you do? What pickups are in them now? Now, um, now is the Psycho Billies actually from our Star oh. Works and Lindy Fralin. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, nice, nice. And my SG, I have the because uh, I got I got a a sixty two SG Les Paul also, which is another one of my very favorite instruments, and that has the Jason Lawler Imperials and. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, the, the story that I wanted to ask you about, because I think it's really unique, is you were one of the first people that I've ever been aware of that was on the Klon train. And, and you, you know, you were, you were an early adopter before anybody else. The Klon story, Bill Finnegan, tell us about, about the early days. Sure. Well, I got a buddy um, named Stevie Gurr, who's a wonderful, wonderful blues and R&B guitar player. And at the time, we were both living in, but we both knew each other from the Bay Area. <clears throat> and he called me up one afternoon and said, hey, I don't know if you're interested or not, but this guy uh, needs somebody to rep his new product at the Santa Monica Guitar Show, and I can't do it. He's this dude named Bill, and he's building this new pedal called the Klon Centaur. And what he's willing to do, if you'll come down to the guitar show for the afternoon and demo the pedal all day, uh, and he'll give you the rap and what to say to people and whatnot, he'll give you one of these pedals as, as your payment for doing it. And I said, sure, I got nothing better to do than go out and hang out at the guitar show all day and make noise. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I got turned on to that. And yeah, for a long time, that was kind of it. I mean, for a really long time in Los Angeles, I would just play my Gretsch or my Les Paul or the Strat or the Tele uh, into the Klon straight into the AC 30 nothing else wow and yeah. you know the sound those guitars sounded so good 
the amp itself sounded so good and was so responsive and the organic quality of that Klon pedal and the way it married to that amp, I barely put any kind of gain on it, just a, just a, a kiss of gain and then just enough boost to, to get it up, you know, to be bigger and, and kind of solo with, you know, and uh, it's an unbeatable combination. I love it. What year was this when, when you did the demo for Bill Finnegan? Hmm. At, at, the sh at the guitar show i'm not sure but i would guess 95 or 6 but i'm, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. yeah that's kind of what i it's kind of what i thought based on kind of the, the generation of your particular clan and oh, what about, how about now you good no, you're fine yeah you're back okay so what was the what was the spiel that he gave you to tell people about the clan back then in 95 Basically, it was pretty simple, you know, and I think a lot of people have grossly misinterpreted what that pedal was supposed to do. Uh, in fact, a lot of the people that are its biggest detractors, well, I would detract from, from it as a pedal also if I were trying to make it do what they want it to do, because it wasn't designed to do that. Like a lot of people think because it has a gain knob on it, they're going to use it like a distortion pedal. Well, it doesn't sound good as a distortion pedal. It's real mid-rangey, and I mean, it's 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 an okay quality of distortion, but to me, it sounds very mid-rangey and kind of dark and doughy when you start cranking that gain knob. But if you keep the gain knob relatively low, you maintain the absolute character of the guitar that you're playing and the amp that you're plugging into, which is really rare, including the feel which is super rare because the minute you break that connection from cable to amp, it always feels a little different. With the Klon, I never had that experience. And the Klon is not designed to be a distortion pedal. It's designed to be a boost. It's designed to fatten your tone and give you more of the goodness that you're looking for in your tone. It's not designed to give you screamy leads. That's not its, that's not its trick. Yeah. But, uh, but for what it does, there's nothing that I have found that does it as well. I mean, I, I eventually sold mine. And again, you know, I'm, I'm kind of myself. I'd like to still have it. But when I saw them get up to 2500 bucks on eBay, I was like, screw this. I'm taking it. Oh, you sold, you sold your gold one? I did. I got $2,500 for it. I couldn't say no. How long ago did this happen? This must have been recent. Not that recent. It's, it's been at least a couple, three years. Uh, right. One of the things that made me sell it actually was you. Uh, <laughs> you turned me on to Chris Van Tassel over at Rocket. Right. And he turned me on to one of his J Rocket Archer series, uh, along with the whole story behind that, which I don't know if we're at liberty to discuss here in public. Um, but it's a pretty great story, and it does indicate that the, that the Archer is certainly one of the best Klon clones out there, if not the best. And Chris was able to give me one of his archers that he uh, put some of his special germanium transistors into that are supposed to more closely match the originals used in the Klons. Um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty damn close. And when it got to the point where I was like, okay, this is really close, it's a lot smaller, and I can get 2500 dollars for one pedal I was, I, it was a no-brainer for me i had to let it go what was the biggest difference for you between the original one and the archer if you could summarize i can't quite put my finger on it in fact i think i may have and i think i may have offended chris um because after i'd used it for a little while i emailed him and told him how much i was enjoying the pedal but that when i a beat it with a real one uh, I was noticing a slight difference in the feel and a very slight difference in the top end character of the pedal. It seemed like it had a little bit more of an almost fizzy quality that wasn't there at all to my ear in the originals. And it leaves a little something that I'm not sure how to describe. Um, and that, you know these 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 elusive elements are 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 tough to work with, you know. But there's some sort of sense of a feeling of muscle to the tone under my fingers on my left hand and the way my pick bounces off the strings um, with the real one that isn't quite there with the with uh, the J Rocket. It's really good. It's 
incredible, in fact. But and you know, to be honest, I I have to be careful here because, like I was saying before, sometimes we we hear with our hearts and and our eyes, you know. And so there may be just some part of me that's emotionally connected to my old vintage one, and they may be even closer than I think. So tell me about um, how you got the call to work with Bob and Rat Dog. Oh, well, interesting story. You know, I, I mean, I, I'd been a fan of the dead when I was a kid. Uh, there wasn't anything called Deadhead back then. It was just, you know, you liked the Grateful Dead, along with Quicksilver Messenger Service and Jefferson Airplane and Moby Grape and the Sons of Champlin and all those great bands that were around in those days that I'm old enough to have been lucky enough to experience as a kid. Um, but I never met those guys. I was never, you know, and I didn't follow them into the 80s. I, I didn't become a deadhead when that happened. I never followed the band around the country. Uh, in fact, they had kind of wound up being, uh, my, my Grateful Dead experience wound up being the three or four CDs in my collection that were kind of my back pages. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, I got this call from a buddy of mine, John Molo, that was a drummer that I was playing with a lot in the L.A. scene. And he was uh, Bruce Hornsby's drummer in Bruce Hornsby in the Range. And he gives me a call one day and he says, don't be surprised if you get a call from the Grateful Dead's management. Uh, Hornsby and I are putting a new band together with those guys and they need somebody to take the Garcia chair. Uh, I was like, yeah, right, they're not going to be calling me. You're out of your tree. And nope, that was not the case because about an hour later, my phone rang and it was this guy saying, hi, this is Cameron Sears with Grateful Dead. Got your number from John Molo. Wondered if you'd be open to coming up and playing with the boys. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd always done horribly at auditions. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'm too much of a people pleaser in trying to be what I thought they wanted me to be instead of being myself. Um, and I think if I'd been myself more, I probably would have got a lot more, a lot more gigs. But in this instance, I kind of decided ahead of time, I wasn't going to get the gig. I thought that's a, that's silly. That's just way too big. I'll never get, you know, that'll never happen. So I brought my Klon and my gold top and they asked me what kind of an amp I'd, I'd like. And I said, well, if you could have a vintage super reverb, that would be awesome. Lo and behold, I got there and there's an early 60s Super Reverb sitting there for me. And um, because I didn't think that I'd get the gig, I was completely relaxed and I had a really good time. And they played a lot of the older material, which was the material I'd grown up on. So I was pretty familiar with it. Uh, it wasn't hard to fake doing it without rehearsal. And... Um, and then we were done and I was ready to file it and say, okay, that was a cool experience. But lo and behold, uh, Cameron, the manager invited me back into the back offices to discuss availability and money. Uh, and I'm sitting there and Lesh, um, the room we'd been playing in was way at the other end of this big warehouse where they used to be at the time. And Lesh took the time and effort to walk all the way through the warehouse and find me in the office with Cameron and say, hey, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know what decisions are going to get made. But I wanted to let you know. We weren't sure this was the right thing to be doing. We weren't sure whether or not this could be fun anymore now that Jerry's gone. And you, just now, showed us this could still be fun. And thank you. Wow. What a compliment. <laughs> and I was like, I was so touched by that. I mean, I, you know, I really didn't give a shit if I got the gig or not at that point. It was like, wow, I had this experience. And then Phil said that and geez, yes, please. You know, <laughs> and they flew me back down to L.A. And it was only a few days later I got the call, you know, get your shit in order, man. You're coming up here. And uh, so began about a 15 year journey. Yeah. Wow. So so was the rig then uh, adapted again once you started doing uh, all the stuff with with Phil and, and, and Bobby? Yeah, it changed around a lot. I mean, in the early, early days, given where I was coming from, uh, I had my pedal board built by Dave Friedman. Um, Dave and I got to be pretty close when I was down there. He was I was living in North Hollywood and his shop was in Andy Brower's place right near where I was. So were they on Cleon? 
That sounds right. You're still unclean on at that point. It's rehearsal space. Um, but anyway, I had my pedal board uh, and I had a super reverb and a matchless. And I was going, I was using the two of them together to just kind of build this big sound stage where, you know, the matchless I felt kind of filled in the mid range that was missing from the V curved fender. Um, and that was how I started out with that stuff and, and my pedal board. And then playing with Steve Kimmock, he had wonderful, wonderful tone and touch. And he started hipping me to things about my rig. You know, first thing we did was uh, we replaced a bunch of my tubes with vintage new old stock tubes. And I was like, oh my God, that makes such a difference. You know, I, here I've been buying new tubes thinking, well, tubes are tubes are tubes. So he got me into that. He got me into changing out some speakers and hipping me to how important, you know, you can try 10 different amps. And sometimes the thing that's really going to make the most difference in your sound is what's the speakers and what's the cabinet design that you're using, you know? So he got me into that stuff. <clears throat> he got me using pyramid strings and going from, I think I was using tens at the time to discovering that with the pyramids, because the alloy, I, I could go up to twelves and still feel good. And then have this really big sound by having those big strings. Um, and that started the process of me gear geeking again. And yeah, little by little, I wound up having a rack rig again, because in that world, tech is not the enemy. Uh, in Grateful Dead world, in fact, the Grateful Dead were, I think, one of the earlier bands to really start adopting uh, serious tech in their rigs, you know, where Jerry and Bobby and Phil all started having rack stuff pretty early on and having custom active guitars built by Alembic and you know they were they were that world they were always uh, cutting edge guitar technology so me getting into that world I still had my tastes I was still going for vintage tone <clears throat> but um, again I was in a position where I wanted a bunch of different sounds and I wanted them at the touch of a button if I could have it mm -hmm. so I went to uh, <clears throat> I went back to a wet dry rig, uh, wet dry wet actually, full on for quite a while, where I was using uh, two 212 cabinets flanking a 412 cabinet. I had a head switcher. I used uh, various combinations of two heads, uh, but one of my favorite ones uh, was utilizing um, my Mad Professor MP101 for kind of the mid crunch and the uh, saturated stuff and using uh, a two rock for that really crystalline bell like clean tone that they're so capable of must uh, have been an early two rock it was pretty early you know steve turned me on to those guys when we started playing together which was back in 98 or 99 yeah 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 i remember uh i remember their rep uh because i was taking guitar lessons in, in katati at zone music you remember that place <laughs> yeah of course and their and their 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 kind of like demonstrator was this guy named Jim Searles. Do you remember Jim Searles? The, he was the luthier next door. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, I remember like you know, because Two Rock was in that same Zone Music complex for a while, yep. and and they also had all those little studios where you take guitar lessons, and so you'd I'd wait you know for my guitar teacher to get ready, and I'd go over and walk over to Bill Crenard, and he had his little shop in there and then Jim Searles is a couple doors down and and uh yeah it was funny he there were the, the only place that sold him other than his own music was a place in Santa Cruz called Tone Gurus I don't know if you remember that place the the name is ringing a bell but not with any kind of story or connection to it yeah yeah so I remember but it, for me it was too complicated at the time it was like uh you know I think I I had just got a deluxe reverb reissue and I was kind of learning that those knobs <laughs> and so when I saw the first like two rock that they had and they were all kind of like named after gemstones like yeah. Onyx or Ruby or oh. Emerald, right there was all these switches and knobs and I just remember like just being confused and not knowing what it did yeah but in my mind I mean not that there's anything wrong with all of that stuff and I'm using a two rock right now I'm using a yeah. uh, but in my mind also, there's uh there's something to be said for the really, really simple and direct thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
And so that rig pretty much stayed consistent the whole time you were you were doing that gig for the wet dry wet system with the axe effects doing the wet. Uh, yes and no, and no, it wasn't all axe effects. Initially, I was using Lexicon stuff um, for delays and reverbs, uh, but I discovered the axe effects, and I discovered that it had a great sounding reverb and delay section and that I could just bypass all the rest of it in my rack rig and use it for that and then still have the modeling capabilities and whatnot when I wanted that. Um, so that was cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, it more or less stayed the same. You know, uh, Friedman built that rig for me and, uh, and then I started scavenging it almost immediately. You know, I, I can very rarely leave well enough alone even when it works great. <laughs> because somebody will come out with a new distortion pedal and that month I'll be all into that distortion pedal. And, you know, the next month I might want to go back to the one I had in there before or somebody else has built a new one or, you yeah. know, I've been trying these new pedals that I really, really like, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> as, as far as a, a new guy who's making me spend money. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a company called B-Tronics. Oh, yeah. Out of Los Angeles, and I bought their Overhive, mm -hmm. pedal, and I just I really like it. Nice, yeah. yeah. They're they're like Brazilian, but they're I think that they are based in LA. I don't know if the stuff's made in LA or if it's made in Brazil, but there's they're definitely like Brazilian, uh, you know, like a it, it looks like it's a family kind of operation. I, I've uh, we had, we had a Nam booth a couple of years ago that was next to them. Oh, nice. And, and it was you know they have a lot of kind of funny. Uh, ways to kind of approach it, you know, with everything being bee themed. And so, you know, they had a guy walking around in a beekeeper suit, <laughs> handing out pamphlets and stuff like that in front of their, their booth. And the booth was all kind of customized uh, to kind of look like, uh, you know, that you were, you were in a, a, a hive of some kind or, but, it, but, it, but I know that there's a lot of people that, that, that speak highly of them, and I've, I've played them in sort of the worst context, which is a NAMM show. So I, I, they seem fine to me in, in the context that I was, that was there, but I certainly uh, owe them a little bit more of a, uh, of, a, of a chance to play it. So I'm glad that, uh, that your recommendation uh, will maybe have me go and try some. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's, uh, it's just a very sort of a warm... Uh, sounding overdrive uh, with a good feel under my fingers. And that's, yes. you know, sometimes that's the most important thing to me. Yeah. Is the, is how does it feel under my fingers? I mean, in some ways that being more important than the tone. Yeah, yeah. Like people talk about uh, some of these big rigs, like the wet, the wet, dry, wet rigs and stuff like that as being a little bit of a waste of time because your audience doesn't really get the benefit of it. It's really for you. And there is some credence to that, uh, to that argument, but my comeback to that argument is, yeah, you're right. But if I'm turned on, if I'm excited by my tone, if I feel like my tone can give me a sense of confidence and connection to what I'm doing, I'm going to play better. Yeah. And from that perspective, the audience does benefit from me having a rig that really excites me. Yeah, I agree with I agree with that completely. Um, Mark, I want to get into I, I want to be respectful of your time, but and it's we're about sixty eight minutes in. But I want to get to one part that I've asked every guest that we've had so far about uh, not only the recommendations in terms of gear, and we've talked about a few pedals already, but also sleeper pedals that you feel like are not on people's radar that they should be aware of This doesn't necessarily need to be only guitar pedals. This could be amps. This could be, you know, instruments kind of Mark Karen's sleeper picks for things that people don't really know about, but they should be checking out. Well, the truth is, I don't know how much uh, stuff I know about that others know about. <clears throat> maybe, maybe some stuff. Okay. Um, let's see what comes to mind. Um, one pedal that I fell in love with that I think came via you also, you know, you and I've spent some time together on pedals and stuff like that. And you've told me a lot of cool rigs and things like that. Um, and you turned me on, I believe, uh, to the Providence Kronos. Oh, the Chrono Delay. Yeah. I, that 
thing. I mean, it's just a delay. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. <clears throat> it does have subdivisions for the for the delays and some stuff like that. But overall, it's just a it's just a digital delay with tap tempo. But something about it just sounds and feels so good. When I got that pedal, I plugged in straight, you know, guitar amp or guitar pedal amp, thinking I was just going to spend five or ten minutes sorting out what the pedal was, and I didn't stop playing for over an hour just because it was so musical. It, it sucked me in, you know. So I love that pedal. Uh, I've mentioned the Overhive by Btronics. It's kind of sitting there as one of my favorite uh, current overdrives, but I'm I'm fickle, you know. I was <laughs> a lot, um, so but but I really I really do like that pedal quite a bit. Uh, let's see what else. Um, I no longer have it, but it's not because I didn't want it. It got stolen, sadly. But the Ka uh, Catlin bred Topanga. Mm is a really nice uh, spring reverb re recreation. I like that a lot. I'm actually currently using their, I think it's called the Talisman, mm -hmm. uh, which is a plate reverb. Mm -hmm. And I really like that because it allows me to do um, a high pass filter, which, uh, you know, it rolls out all the low end from the reverb without touching the primary signal, uh, which just clarifies the a lot and still gives you that sense of spaciousness mm -hmm. um so i i like that pedal a lot um mad professor amps i know a lot of people know about <clears throat> mad professor pedals and bjorn jewel and all that stuff uh, and that's great stuff for sure but their amps are pretty spectacular um i had the cs40 originally which is this ridiculously adjustable uh, sort of vintage platform, but with lots of um, access point and tech bells and whistles in terms of how you can dial it in and tune it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful amp, but for whatever reason, I didn't find myself using it that much. But for somebody that's looking for that kind of platform, it's a great amp. But the amp I want to talk about is their MP101. It's 101 watt. <laughs> uh, two channel platform um, EO34 based uh, although I do believe you can use 6L6s if you want or you know some other tubes um, and what I like about this amp is the clean channel for me is great because you can set it up pretty damn clean and it works cool for that but what I love is that you can set it up to be that kind of amp that's on the verge of breakup. So when you open your guitar up all the way and dig in, you're singing and you've got that nice little crunch on the attacks and stuff like that. Um, but you just barely back down and you have a good warm, fat, clean tone. And then the lead side, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it's kind of over the top, or at least it's capable of being over the top. And it's fairly dark. And it has a lot of mid-range, and I don't know why, but I really, really like the lead tone for just sort of singing kind of, for lack of a better reference point, maybe Eric Johnson-ish uh -huh. leads. Uh, so that amp is, is cool and, and uh, underappreciated. I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would guess if you poked around and found a used one, you might be able to get a pretty good deal on one of those. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of looking to see kind of what the going rate is on them because I, I agree with you. I don't I don't really hear much about those amps, although I remember them. I mean, it looks like new, uh, new. They're they're around thirty five hundred dollars. I can see that there's one for sale at at Primax um, online. I don't see any. I don't see any used though. So maybe maybe Reverb will be the. The place I'm curious to see if there actually is one. I'd be curious too, because I, I think the thing is, sadly, um, their marketing in this country has been uh, not super effective. Yeah. And when you have the cost as much as that amp costs them to make and what they want, you know, the price point they want to sell it at, when you add all the duty and VAT and whatnot that happens when you have to get here from Finland, uh, they get really pricey. And I think it's actually, it's hurt them. The exchange rate and whatnot is hurt. Yeah, so here's here's one. Oh yeah, there you go. 
and it's about 2000. This is coming from uh, Bergamo, Italy. Uh-huh. Uh huh. $2,000 and $200 just to ship it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's yeah, it, it sort of looks it sort of looks Italian, and it, it, it like this is owned by an Italian because it's very has. It's it's definitely got a little extra sauce to it. Well, the, and the red and black kind of has that. Thing. You know, mine mine is uh, much more classically hippie looking. You know, mine has a, a natural wood front. <laughs> but yeah. I don't think I'll ever sell that amp. I mean, I'm not really using it a whole lot right now because my main amp that I'm using is my Two Rock Custom Clean Hundred, mm -hmm. and I'm using that as a pedal platform and getting my distortion from pedals right now. Mm -hmm. But I still I love that amp so much, and I've used it to to such great uh, ends so much that I have no interest in selling the thing. Um, I'm going to say this is not a sleeper, but in case there are people that don't know, uh, the old Silvertone Twin Twelve. Oh yeah, Silvertone Twelve Twin Twelve, of course. I mean, if you if you love that classic old sort of '60s Fendery kind of tone. But you don't want to spend Fendery kind of money. Uh, it's not. It's not exactly a Fender. It's not a straight up Fender circuit by any stretch of the imagination. But I really love the sound of that amp. I used to have one when I was a teenager, and I hadn't played one in years. And uh, I, I used to play guitar for Delaney Bramlett quite a bit, and he was raving about the Silvertone. I was like, dude, I forgot all about those. Mm -hmm. And I went online, and you can still buy one for. You know, between six and eight, maybe nine hundred dollars, and yeah. you know they're forty, forty-five watts. So in a lot of smaller situations, they're more than enough. Uh, they sound killer if you just crank them the fuck up. I mean, they have their their own overdrive thing is really wonderful, but they're actually you know if you don't need a lot of volume, it's a really good clean or cleanish platform too. I I found myself playing through that a lot at Sweetwater and Terrapin and some of the venues in the Bay Area that were smaller uh, because my big rigs, I've got a master volume them down so far, you know, it's kind of silly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're great. I, I find them on Craigslist quite a bit for, for less than that, maybe 500. I got the one that's in our showroom for, I think like 450 or something like that with the, with the speaker cabinet. Wow. That's great. Yeah. I also love their design. I don't understand why more people haven't done it. You know, the thing where uh, you take the head off the top, it's a, it's a head and cabinet piggyback, and there's a space in the bottom of the speaker cabinet, and you slide the head in there, and then you flip down a couple things to hold it in place. Yeah. Got your piggyback rig, but it's a one-hand deal, so you can grab your guitar in one hand, your amp in the other, and you're done. Yeah, yeah, I thought mechanically it, it had an interesting concept. I mean, the, the, the material that the cabinet's made out of is absolute garbage, <laughs> but, but the idea is there. The sound, too. Right? I mean, that press board is bound to resonate differently than if they were using birch or something like that. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly right. So maybe part of the signature sound, although maybe not optimal for reliability. Well, I think that's true of like, you know, one of the other things I was going to mention, and again, probably not sleepers to a lot of people. But I've developed a, a real passion for the funky old guitars, the cheap ones, the K's and the Dan Electros and the Supros and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and a lot of those Dano guitars, for example, you know, they were press board, you know, <laughs> press board and, form, and formica. So uh, certainly not tone woods. Yeah, uh, it's like a countertop. <laughs> you know, that's part of it. them sound the way they sound, which is why when you have a new one, it's got the same body shape and the same design aesthetic not the same guitar yeah 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 well th those are i think that those are all i think the mad professor was certainly a, a sleeper takeaway for me without a doubt um that's that's a good that's a good channel switching one and i i suspect if you were to scour the internet you'll find some that are that are cheap just because there's there's not uh they, i'm sure that they're probably hard to sell you know because not a lot of people know about them and then and so in that sense sometimes you'll get some bargains um i actually wound up my cs40 I and mean, that's their flagship amp that's 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 the big important one uh and again no, no nobody really knows about it over here or very few people really know about it and so i was all to sell it because i thought i'd really lose my butt on it yeah and it was actually wonderful because the way it worked out was eli from two rock 
uh, knew very much about that amplifier, had had one at one point and had let go of it and regretted it, mm. seen another one. So he and I were actually able to work out a deal where I gave him my CS40 and a little bread and he built me uh, my 100 watt custom clean. Nice, nice. Yeah, it all worked out then. Yeah, well, well Mark, um, this was wonderful. I, I really appreciate you kind of taking us through the, the career, the tones, the Klon story, I think was one that's definitely, we're gonna have to like cut out that section and, and reuse it so that like it's it's an, I've, I've I've talked about since you told me that story and I also remember the the person that introduced me to the Klon uh, is a guy that watches these quite a bit his name is George Adelson and uh, he he was the kind of the I, he, I think I bought my first boutique pedal from him on Craigslist when I was in high school or maybe yeah my last I think it was senior in high school and he had a Klon, I remember. But the pedal I bought from him was a Full Tone 69 Fuzz, the big oh. box red one. I have a hand-painted one. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, did, I don't have. Oops. <laughs> Lost an knob. Yeah, I don't have the I don't have the hand-painted one, but I had the one that was sort of like a in a you know, the, the bent metal enclosure that was sort of, you know, larger size. Yes. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so, but I remember he was talking to me about it and, and he, and he had talked to me about the, you know, the thing you said where it's really a boost and you, you turn the, the gain knob. So it faces the led, you know, so it should be point, pointing about the led and that's about the amount of gain that you want. And then you volume and tone to taste, you know, and, uh, sound about right. <laughs> Not for me. You had a higher than that. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm understanding what you're saying. If, what I would do is I would turn the gain uh, from off. If off was like uh, maybe seven o'clock, mm -hmm. I would turn it up to maybe nine o'clock. So not quite, uh, not quite nine o'clock actually. Probably between eight and nine. Yeah. And then I would usually take the tone knob and kick it back towards darker just a tiny bit, hardly at all. Yeah. Um, and then what I would do with the uh, output knob is I would set it to unity gain. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I would keep turning it on and off until it got to be equal. Yeah. And then I would just turn it up a little from there. Yeah. You know? I think I think it's pretty similar. So, so you know, like the, L, the, the LED is sort of maybe somewhere around 7 or 8 o'clock on the gain. Okay. And so yeah, that he would say is he turned the gain down to around where that it where so that the knob was pointing like the arrow was pointing toward the LED, right? And then he would volume, you know, and, and tone to taste. That's but um, yeah, but I remember that, and, and and I you know I didn't own a Klon for for years after that just because they weren't that much money, but they were they were more than most pedals at that time. Even if you bought one directly from Bill, you know, it was still I think like three hundred bucks or two fifty, I think. Yeah, 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 something like that. So, uh, yeah, this is really cool, though. I think these, these stories are great, and, and, I, and I really appreciate your time and your willingness to, to share kind of your gear stories and, and uh, kind of your, your journey to working with uh, Bobby and Phil and uh, your time in L.A. So I, I supremely appreciate it, and I very much uh, look forward to, to getting this out on, on podcast form as well. Of course, anybody that's watching this now, I also have linked in the description where you can find the podcast. This will release separately on a audio only version. I'm recording it on my end. Mark's also recording it on his end. So if you want to listen to it in uh, any kind of its full format and in, in uh, high, high quality MP3, it'll be available there. And then Mark, if people want to check out what you're up to, where's the best place for them to do that? Oh gosh. Uh, especially right now. I'm so un unfocused on that stuff in so many ways. <laughs> I do have markcaron.com. Uh, I'm horrible about updating dates there. If you want general information, that's pretty good. Otherwise, you know, I'm on Facebook uh, and I do post when I have my own shows. I don't tend to promote a whole lot for other people's shows because I feel like it waters down the promotion for what I'm trying to do with my own thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times for people to find out what I'm doing, it's a little haphazard. <laughs> well, 
so so they could follow you on facebook or or on uh instagram or one of the one of one of the the social medias i suppose it would be the, the easiest way if they really want to try to figure facebook, out what you're up to facebook hey. the best okay i probably work my personal page more than i do my pro page which i okay. never form but um and then the other thing is you can always subscribe to my mailing list uh, again, I don't do a lot about gigs that I'm doing where I'm just sort of hired as a side man, mm -hmm. but it would keep you abreast of anything that I was doing that was my own thing if I do something that I consider a, a big deal. What about like in terms of if people want to get lessons or do anything like that, are you offering any of that stuff or is... Well, yeah, and, and, and I've, I've been exploring uh, Zoom lessons. I've been doing the online thing more. Okay. Uh, you can definitely uh, reach out to me via the website for that. Okay. Yeah. So website to schedule Zoom lessons if people are interested in that. Wonderful. Or you can always PM me on Facebook. Okay. Message on Facebook. Great. Well, Mark, thank you again for your time, for sharing your story so openly. And uh, I, I look forward to doing another one of these with you in the near future. Me too, man. It was fun. All right. See you later. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.